This is uh, a really unique opportunity, and I think it might be the first in DC um, to look at the events of the last couple of months in Armenia and try to put them in context and understand um, you know, what is it that's happening now and what are the opportunities that it poses um, for Armenia. Uh, we were all very surprised when we saw uh, a youth movement, an opposition movement, um, a very kind of savvy use of uh, social media um, in what Pashinyan called a velvet revolution. Um, I think uh, those of us who observe Armenia uh, saw some of these trends for a long time, yet we were still struck by um, how sudden and popular it was and how, how, how many results there have been and how peaceful all of it was. Um, so one of the questions that people are asking themselves is uh, to what degree is this a revolution like the color revolutions or like Arab Spring? Um, Pashinyan, the main leader, has called it a velvet revolution, yet he's also insisted that everything is within the constitutional um, bounds and that um, law and due process uh, will be followed very, very strictly, um, which some political scientists say um, is a key indicator and a very important factor in terms of uh, long-term success of this, of this um, uh, process. Uh, so we're at this you know, remarkably interesting moment um, where transition has started in Armenia. Um, and we are uh, wondering um, where did it come from? What, was, what has it all been about? What is the agenda? Um, what is the outlook over the next year or so? Um, and we're delighted that we have with us uh, three people who are real leaders in Armenian civil society who've done um, a really wonderful work for many years on different aspects um, of um, anti-corruption, election work, support for NGOs and civil society, education, and so forth. We have uh, Sona Vezian, who is the Executive Director of Transparency Inter International Anti-Corruption Center. Daniel Inanisian, he's the founder of the Union of Informed Citizens. Um, which works on um, uh, tracing misinformation and um, uh, making sure it doesn't uh, shape public opinion and, and decision making, educating the public about it. And Larissa Minyasan is the executive director of the Open Society Foundation in Armenia. And I, I um, hasten to thank um, OSF. We're doing this together and uh, have um, uh, many uh, uh, similar um, goals and programs and um, are delighted to be um, uh, doing, doing this event um, as a joint effort. So um, the way we'll do this is I'll pose some questions and I'll ask the panel to respond and then we will do that. Um, we'll cover a few items and then we will um, invite questions from the audience at the end. So why don't we start with kind of that first question of where did this movement come from, and um, what what does it what does it mean? How did you observe it in in Armenia? And why don't we start um, with with Larissa for kind of framing the events themselves? Thank you, thank you, Miriam. Thank you, uh, colleagues. Um, so good to see uh, so many um, uh, familiar uh, faces and friends. Um, as justly pointed, this was a surprise not only uh, in DC, but the, we, um, having worked in so many years in Armenia, were equally surprised. Um, uh, to understand, um, at the moment, Armenia is in transition, and this is a, a very different transition. Uh, a very different transition that probably hasn't happened in our history, in independent history, even in early 90s. This is a democratic transition happening in the least possible place, in the least imaginable place, and happening uh, exactly for democratic cause, the cause of good governance, human rights, um, and against uh, dictatorial rule. So um, to uh, understand, um, as, as unique is the transition, 
the movement was also unique. The, we had a history, uh, Armenia luckily had a history of many protests. It wasn't a um, kind of dead country. Uh, but protests like this, we haven't had. And, um, and, and, and that leads to a transition that hasn't been there. Uh, the, in, in hindsight, because we haven't uh, predicted it, uh, we worked to, to, for it to happen, uh, the transition, but we haven't predicted either the protest, its scale, its uh, consistency, its coherency of the message, that, uh, that's absolutely true and we're surprised. But in the hindsight, uh, it is clear that what was happening in Armenia, an extreme uh, uh, authoritarian consolidation. And right before the protest happens and because the protest happens, the last step of that consolidation was to happen. Um, a, uh, uh, a very strong anti-democratic of uh, prime minister's position was legally constituted through constitutional, and it was to be summoned by the old guard, by the very same Ser Sargsyan, whose rule was absolutely enormously unpopular and very corrupt and totalitarian in nature. So, uh, but that this totalitarian kind of protest, anti-totalitarian protest would be so consistent, more consistent and more um, uh, vehement in a country where any protest was first to declare itself apolitical. Like if you remember Electric Yerevan, the youth would declare itself apolitical. And the very political nature, uh, uh, a very political protest would be the strongest, the most consistent, and this was uh, something very unexpected and unique about this, uh, this movement. Um, we saw youth that we, uh, we dreamed but never imagined there was, uh, youth that was probably not very well educated in social sciences, or, but youth that was intrinsically understanding the notion the, 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 the quest for uh, democracy was so high. And we saw people of all the, uh, all the uh, walks of life coming exactly under this, exactly because it basically, one could say, the, the, the totalitarian squeezing and tightening of, uh, of the regime flew into, uh, broke and uh, flew into uh, the face of, uh, of, uh, of the regime. Of course, the fact that civil society didn't, um, uh, did summon its position of guarding the freedom of uh, assembly, guarding the freedom of uh, um, uh, uh, people's uh, freedom and people being detained, but also very clearly found itself the place because it was a very much civil society quest. It was not a political regime change. It was against the dictatorial uh, kind of ceiling of dictatorial uh, state in a way. So I think that was the precondition that uh, led to consistency of the movement, uh, to its um, uh, strengths, to its, uh, surprisingly to its strengths, but also one very important thing. We can talk of uh, strong civil society and educated youth and kind of long uh, ways of, of, uh, that we contributed, hopefully, but there was one very important thing. There was a leader who took enormous political responsibility. Um, uh, responsibility in view of a regime that did unequivocally uh, prove that it could go to, it could, could uh, spare no means to uh, stay in power. And that determination and that responsibility that was so visible and so unique in our history, I think that was very important too. Maybe colleagues would um, contribute too. Yeah, actually I would like uh, to add something regarding uh, the reasons why why it could happen, no, why, why, why it happened, but why it, uh, it was possible to happen. And the main reason is that we we had few online media in Armenia that were broadcasting everything that was happening uh, quite objectively in uh, life, and we have quite wide uh, internet network in Armenia. And everyone knew that the sensitive information should be received from these particular media resources and from social networks. 
that was very, very important. That was the main, the main factor that uh, made this, this situation possible. Thank you. Uh, I would like uh, to add a few things, um, also agreeing with my colleagues, of course. So um, whatever happened in Armenia uh, seems surprising, but on the yeah, other hand, uh, on the other hand, uh, when we uh, look back and try to analyze, uh, we understand that there have been preconditions for such an event. Uh, maybe the scope and the uh, form and the format, the success was uh, surprising for all of us actually, and it's very pleasant that we are very uh, we are very proud to have such an outcome, but uh, the social unrest was inevitable. Uh, the elections have been being falsified for um, several decades, and people understood that it is impossible to have a political change, change in the governing regime uh, through electoral system, which made uh, people think about armed uh, reaction or something else. And we already had armed attack uh, two years ago, which was unsuccessful, as we know. So people have, were thinking about uh, getting, re getting out of this situation. Though the general, generally, uh, there people were very apathetic, very um, desperate, so they couldn't find uh, the way out. Uh, however, they were very unhappy, very critical. Uh, and also, we should recognize that for at least 10 years, there have been kind of preparation, if we can call it, of the civil society, uh, to, which brought us to this uh, point, because there have been, the, the regime basically made people to fight against its different decisions in different fields, in different geographic areas throughout the country, and people were already used to different types of protests, they were being used uh, of, uh, to being beaten by the police, and uh, for, uh, for each time they were getting more and more experienced. And basically whatever happened was the culmination of all these. Um, and also the methods uh, that have been used were very critical also for the success because just from the beginning it was declared as a peaceful movement and it was very important. And uh, one thing that would unite uh, Armenian citizens uh, at this point of uh, time was the hatred towards Serge Sarkisian and his regime. And in that regard, the movement was very successful and it framed the slogan very successfully, reject Serge, take a step, reject, reject Serge. And you didn't need to, uh, to uh, explain people what uh, you want to say, what they need to do. Um, so it was very critical, uh, and basically people were on the edge of this, you know, hatred. But the good thing was that this whole hatred was transformed into uh, positive energy, and it was uh, very critical for uh, this, for the um, success of this. And also uh, there were some democratic measures, you know, uh, within the uh, organization of the revolution itself. Uh, it was a de decentralized effort. All the people throughout the country were taking part by doing something uh, to help the revolution. Um, this much. Thank you. Um, so let's um, shift now to kind of looking at where, taking stock of where we are now and what the uh, short to medium term prospects and goals are. Um, Pashinyan has become the prime minister. Um, as of yesterday, the former ruling party, the Republicans, lost their majority in parliament. Um, the, today was either debated or maybe already approved the, the plan of the, new, of the new government. So it seems like there's um, quite a bit of, you know, only a few days ago we were debating um, how and when could Armenia come um, to parliamentary, to early parliamentary elections. Now that looks um, more clear and, and feasible, but what are what are the next, um, can you map out for us kind of what are the next um, pieces in this transition and what are 
some of the um, kind of challenges and, and main problems that uh, the, the government has to deal with. Um, corruption, um, anti-corruption plans, uh, transitional justice, kind of where, where do you see um, the main um, uh, issues that, that need to be solved in the, in the near term? Um, though the government is calling itself as a transitional government and it is planning uh, to have elections uh, in a year, so the program that they submitted is for uh, five years, basically. However, there are some priority tasks that, that are, and uh, it, it is going to work in uh, all the directions, basically. Uh, uh, besides uh, working in uh, organizing uh, SNAP elections. However, uh, several things are really a priority for the government, and one is um, to uh, prepare for uh, early elections. And uh, though it, is, it would be much more uh, beneficial, probably advantageous for Nikol Pashinyan's political party to have elections as soon as possible because he's so popular at the moment, and uh, people have some doubts of what would be his popularity after some time passes and whether his government will not fail because there are a lot of uh, non-professionals basically uh, in the government. However, uh, he is doing the right thing because he, say, he thinks that uh, there is need for preparation uh, at least for the electoral code. Uh, it's very important that the electoral code uh, changes before the elections uh, because we do not, uh, basically our elections of the last year, uh, they uh, were not a political process. They were uh, an economic process. So the uh, 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 electoral code set grounds for uh, vote buying for um, competition of uh, uh, economic situa economic um, possibilities of the uh, uh, rivals. Uh, it did um, basically uh, provide incentives for the businessmen to uh, run for a member of parliament position, uh, to provide them in immunity, uh, to provide security for their businesses, um, this has been our case for many years, actually, but it was kind of legalized through the electoral code. That's why, and uh, those that format that has been uh, included in the electoral code was so-called territorial proportional lists. The government was kind of claiming that it's going to get rid of the majoritarian system and move only to the proportional uh, system. However, in fact, they left this majoritarian system, they just uh, changed the name into a territorial proportional list. Whereas the uh, rich people were competing for uh, uh, different positions, they were putting a lot of money throughout the country to buy people's vote on, and buy people's vote not only for themselves, but for the political parties. And uh, this is something that is this is the priority thing that uh, should be changed in the electoral code. And there are some other things as well, like the uh, transparency uh, and accountability of the political party finance uh, and uh, 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 prevention of the administrative resource use. There is a need to prepare uh, the. There is a plan, actually, by the Prime Minister to uh, develop a new unit within the police or probably in other law enforcement bodies, which will uh, directly uh, be engaged in the uh, prevention of the electoral violations and also like, uh, detection of electoral violations. So these are some things that need to be done in order to ensure um, grounds for free, fair, and transparent elections in Armenia. Some other things, priority things, are um, the political prisoners. Uh, we have several um, dozens of political prisoners, uh, though the previous government was kind of uh, arguing whether these are political prisoners or not, but in the, uh, in the opinion of people, they are. And we already witnessed that some political prisoners are getting out of the jail. Uh, though Nikol Pashinyan's government didn't do anything as an executive body uh, to uh, release these people, however, um, he did a, ve a very uh, he took a, c a very uh, correct stance. 
saying that I'm not going to intervene in the judicial uh, activities. So the ju judges have to take their own decisions. They have to take the responsibility for their own, uh, their own decisions. So we are in a process that we anticipate more and more uh, political pro prisoners to get out of the jails. And finally, anti-corruption. So for, uh, since 2003, Armenia had an anti-corruption program and the government was kind of working with the international community a lot, uh, uh, trying to raise funds for the fight against corruption and lots of money has been spent for this. And the government never budgeted for any, any cent for anti-corruption uh, within its uh, state budget. And this is the first time within this last month that we observe a uh, real fight against corruption. Uh, for many years, we have, as an uh, anti-corruption organization, we were criticizing the government uh, that uh, we, we do not see any political will. Yes, there are uh, some legal uh, acts being changed, some legal grounds are being prepared, like whistleblower uh, legislation, illicit enrichment legislation, um, conflict of interest rate legislation, but this is not enough and there should be enforcement and we never observed any enforcement. And now Nikol Pashinyan's government with its very limited resources because he still ha doesn't have control over like prosecutor's office or uh, a day ago, ago he didn't have a, a control over a special investigator's office, but, sti but still the police and the um, national security office are working really hard and they are revealing cases of corruption day by day. I will leave uh, uh, something to tell you from. <laughs> yeah, if I may. Um, in our, this is a moment tra of transformation. Transformation supported by vast majority of Armenian population. And to kind of summon this, uh, uh, kind of to co comprehend how unique this is, this was a country with lowest trust among people towards people even. Lower, lowest trust in institutions. So now we have enormous trust into a very political process. Um, we have um, maybe in unprecedented number of people supporting this in a, with a parliament of 3.5, uh, um, with a parliament where majority still is uh, or supported only by 3.5 people, percent of people. So uh, it is clear that this transformation is not going to be easy with the um, still political power they hold, uh, Republicans hold in the parliament and still very much consolidated machinery in the, uh, in the government. So political support for this transformation, a very democratic transformation is extremely important. We need to, uh, uh, we need to raise awareness that there is, uh, there is this uh, very difficult and very uh, kind of upscale transformation happening and it needs to be supported. Uh, it needs to be supported uh, simply because uh, with this amassed uh, political uh, capital and uh, a material capital as the Republican Party has amassed, the counter-revolutionary efforts are uh, quite visible. And, uh, and those are going to be, the, the resources are going to be exploited during the elections, um, during uh, the efforts to fight corruption, because any fight against corruption is now pre, uh, presented as uh, political persecution or, poli or, 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 um, or acts, acts of uh, politi politically targeted acts. So uh, that's very important to have this uh, support. And one other thing, today as uh, we know the program, the uh, government program was uh, approved and it is still a long time towards the elections. And that program is extremely uh, uh, politically uh, correct because that's the first political program we have. All other programs were quick fixes uh, as we go. Um, so there, uh, yet we have a very unexperienced government in quite hostile environment politically and uh, um, ex executive wise. So um, successful implementation, support towards success of that, towards implementation of that, quite robust uh, 
transformation plan is very important. Um, so this is uh, this is uh, this is what we're trying to summon among ourselves as civil society to support uh, implementation because those are all the goals that we have been lobbying, starting with acknowledgement and fight against domestic uh, violence, going all into high uh, bubble capture, state capture. So uh, and uh, and and expert support uh, exchanges between. Uh, 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 exchange missions to the government are extremely important at this moment. Um, um, expert assistance of the expert community from Western countries, as well as um, uh, from the executives of these countries, is also extremely important. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, before coming to to your question, I would like to present a little bit the environment that actually we have in Armenia because uh, the environment of, of ruling the country or the, or the game rules of ruling the country have been changed significantly. We have now executive government that shares democratic values, that shares human rights respect, that shares, uh, I don't know, the values that we in this in this room share, uh, but on the other side, they are somehow unexperienced in in ruling country. They have some vision how the country should be, but they are quite unexperienced. And uh, at the same time, we have some people who are still in their offices who would love the previous environment to come back like some people in prosecutor's office, in judiciary, first of all, uh, some people in local self-governance, uh, they, they were making money on corruption. And they really would love the previous system to come back. They don't like the new environment. And, uh, and here is where the threat of contra-revolution came. When I, mean, when I say contra-revolution, I mean the contra-revolution of uh, of game rules, contra-evolution of values. So that's why we as a civil society were afraid of it and uh, we're somehow supporting the government, the executive government, to keep these rules. Uh, so um, concerning uh, electoral uh, reforms, I should mention that elections last year in 2017, there were not they were not falsified in the polling stations, generally speaking. There were, we didn't saw uh, things like ballot stuffing or, or other such way falsifications in 2017. But at the same time, we've seen that the results of elections have nothing to do with the, with the will of the people. And thanks God, I don't need to prove it anymore uh, after the recent events. Uh, yeah, the Republican Party now, due to Gallup, has just 3.5% of public support, but they have something like 50% seats of parliament. Uh, but the problem is that th the, this crisis couldn't be solved just by holding a snap election. Because of the problem is coming from the electoral system, we had quite complicated, and I guess I shouldn't go in quite details because it's a, it's a long story, but we have quite complicated and manipulative electoral system, which is called rating or district list uh, electoral system. So first of all, the electoral system should be uh, changed. The amendments in electoral could, uh, code should be done. And after that, we can have snap elections. Uh, particularly while speaking about uh, amendments, first of all, is the electoral system, as Sona also ma mentioned. Uh, after that, few amendments should be done in order to prevent the competition of pockets and to bring the competition of ideas, competition of values, but uh, to kill this tradition of competition of pockets during the elections, particularly because of uh, some of those uh, guys or groups who would love the mentioned uh, contra-revolution, who would support this contra-revolution of values or contra-revolution of uh, 
game rules, they are quite rich. They are, uh, they still own uh, quite a big amount of money. They still uh, have support of, of some oligarchs. And of course, uh, those oligarchs are interested in the previous system. Uh, so that's why it's important to have elections with the competition of ideas, competition of values. Uh, and the last important part of amendments is uh, some amendments not even technically in electoral code but in uh, criminal code in order to have an effective fight against the electoral violations, electoral crimes. Uh, of course, uh, we, we see many other, say, smaller uh, amendments, but those are the main, main three ways, main three directions of amendments that we think should be done in electoral code. And hopefully we will have the draft of electoral code in a few weeks and uh, adopted uh, amendments in, in mid-July, probably. Mm. Yeah, uh, the government is now forming uh, a working group where civil society would be involved as well. Civil society, uh, so representatives of executive government and uh, representatives of parliamentary fractions, maybe representatives of other political parties as well. Uh, and the working group would work on, on electoral amendments next, next few weeks. So are you finding um, if the, the, the phrase that, um, that this is a moment to support the government, is, is the main thing that you mean by that from civil societies to kind of provide ideas? Is this a time that there are working groups that can feed expertise? I mean, as you said, that the government is somewhat new, I mean, obviously very new, but has fairly young people there. That this is, how, how is civil society supporting this effort? Um, I can bring just a few, uh, few examples. One example is electoral amendments. We, we really do support them in understanding the problems uh, in electoral code, in even in drafting uh, the amendments. And other examples are some, some drafts of other decisions, for example, that, that we made. Uh, a few weeks ago, we, made, we, we wrote a draft of, uh, of decision by government regarding some transparency issues to make some databases transparency, transparently. Uh, more transparent and it would be very useful for investigative journalism, for anti-corruption investigations by the civil society. And we were told that uh, today or tomorrow uh, the government will adopt it. Uh, we, we see that we are in the same value field with them and we're trying to help them with the expertise, as you mentioned, uh, with some support in, uh, let's say, public way, so with, with our statements, with our speeches, uh, with this type of meetings, we're trying to, to support what they are doing, unless they are doing something that we, we really like. Can I, if I may add to your, um, I think it's all that Daniel said, but more. Uh, the point is that um, the, tra the transformation is really kind of, um, basic it's 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 very um, deep and multi layer um, there is enormous um, desire for public debate and discourse which hasn't been part of the so we see the role of civil society provide that forum for people to be able to uh, have idea exchanges, to have educated themselves in political way, because this is something that with media completely controlled and um, showing uh, uh, TV shows of uh, low quality, th this was there was no way to deliver that. So that is one basic thing. And the most uh, important thing is that in the course of last 10, 15 years, there is a huge development in civil society's policy capacity. We have been developing 
policies in anti-corruption, in communication, as was said, in criminal justice, um, a, a justice group that has been supported by the foundation throughout five, six years has entire revision of the criminal code, judicial code, criminal procedural code with suggestions. These are not just now take it and implement. This is something that can be debated, discussed uh, professionally, because we know that there is a counterpart that is listening. And there are people who are interested. Of course, not everyone is going to, compare, to debate criminal code, but at least there is expert community that can contribute. So there is this need uh, to have policy exchange, because the need for policy capacity development within the new government, not the old guys, the new government is very important. Just to add something, this is the first time that Armenia has a government with democratic values, something that we have been preaching and working uh, for in for um, the last decades. Uh, so we think that it's our responsibility to uh, help this government to uh, get instituted, to get uh, confident, and to continue this. Uh, good practices that they started with. And also, uh, we understand the vulnerability of the situation because of the counter-revolution, as it was said, because of uh, the lack of experience that the government has. So we feel it's our responsibility to kind of uh, help them to, with our uh, expertise, uh, to become stronger and to kind of uh, implement the uh, plans, the programs that they have uh, adopted or based on which they also came to power. Great, thanks. Um, and what, what role do you see for outsiders now? I mean, you talked about civil society, how civil society can help, but what about the international community, donors, um, the diaspora? What, what are the real pressing needs and how can they be met? There are so many, I'll name some and uh, colleagues will. Uh, obviously there is uh, very much interest in donor and international community towards Armenia. Many want to help and uh, this um, and, and this is a unique time to help, not only because of the vastness of the problem, but because that help will not be wasted because we have a government which is listening, which is acknowledging uh, deficiencies, and is ready to uh, have that help. Uh, however, uh, that is also a problem. Many want help, many want to help, and um, there might be very much um, uh, dichotomy in that uh, helping uh, process. So there needs to be um, coordination and very, very, very much, not only coordination, but collective elaboration of priorities and uh, scope of, uh, of, of, of action. Uh, because the, 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 unfortunately the situation uh, that has been inherited is quite, uh, quite problematic in so many areas. Justice, human rights, social affairs. Uh, I mean, the entire range: education, health, uh, labor rights. So, uh, so prioritization and having that for uh, diaspora. I think uh, there is a unique role because we have seen diaspora helping enormously, uh, donating huge uh, amounts, but having no um, and not willing actually uh, have much say in how to uh, how to reform. Um, now, because they were not much welcome, um, now it is time to not only uh, donate and uh, help through expertise, which is huge, but also raise the bar for democratic and social outlook for the uh, for the country. Because um, uh, we, with the help came very lenient um, uh, approach of diaspora towards Armenian state, meaning that yeah, this is a new country, this is new uh, state. Uh, there, uh, we could have done much better, and we can do much better, democratically reforming and economically reforming. So diaspora should be raising that bar as a uh, as a also participant in the and contributor to the reform. That's my take. But um, let's see. Um, I would like to mention that uh, the peaceful uh, outcome of Armenia's revolution was uh, also 
pretty much contributed by the international community's stance in this in the situation. Uh, they were very supportive uh, of, uh, you know, pushing the, the Armenian government not to take violent actions uh, in the process, not to violate human rights, and it was uh, it played a decisive role, I think. So, and uh, we hope that the international communities. Um, interest uh, in the development of, development of the democratic regime of the human rights in Armenia will uh, continue will be there. And uh, it, it, there can be different possibilities of um, helping this, like providing uh, political solidarity of the new government uh, base, being basing on its uh, democratic performance and appreciation of human rights uh, and human dignity, uh, making statements, making speeches, uh, organizing probably trips to Armenia of different types of delegations, uh, and um, providing some professional assistance or supporting professional assistance for the government of Armenia based on the needs identified uh, by the government uh, itself. As for the diaspora, it's uh, we have been uh, saying this for several years. It's not a new um, uh, call, but uh, diaspora organizations, besides working on the genocide issue, we think that uh, they should be taking more active part in the democratic development of the country. We were very glad to see how diaspora participated in this revolution process because in uh, almost all countries where they had big communities, so they were somehow uh, taking actions there, taking rallies, uh, protesting against the Armenian embassies. So uh, now it's time for them to also uh, contribute to the democratic development of the country in different ways. Um, because of many things were said by, by my colleagues, I would like just to add something that this type of I would say even unprecedented uh, democratic jump that we we observe in Armenia and hopefully we will observe it in next few years at least. Um, I guess it should be supported not only to have some some good changes in Armenia, but also to be an example uh, for for other nations that are living not in a good, not in a democratic environment, that look, in Armenia such a unprecedented thing could happen, you can do that again, and the international community will support you to do reforms, will support you to, uh, to have a better country. I guess this is, also, this is very important. This is a very important message that could be sent to, to others that if they will do the same, they will, uh, they will enjoy the support. Um, that's something that I would like to add to, to things that, to quite important things that were already said by Sona and Larissa. Well, that's actually, um, that's a perfect transition to the, my, the next question that I wanted to ask, and this will be my last question before we turn to the audience, I'm sure all of you have. Um, all kinds of things that you'd like to ask. Um, and I wanted to ask about the region. Um, what, uh, you know, there's been a lot of uh, talk about what has Russia's role been? Uh, um, does, does Armenia's uh, kind of overall orientation change? And Pashinyan has basically said no. I mean, how do you, how does, there were protests just now in Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, is, uh, is Armenian example catching on already in Karabakh and elsewhere? What do you, um, one of Pashinyan's first trips was to Georgia, um, and there's kind of looking for a better relationship in Georgia. How does the change of the government and the new kind of, uh, the, the drive for democracy change um, or impact the, the regional and foreign policy uh, outlook for Armenia? Um, I'm not a foreign policy expert, so <laughs> with that limitation, um, uh, I have to say that um, y uniqueness of what has happened in Armenia was in its tremendous 
mass support and ownership by by the people. This was uh, this was literally the awakening of a citizenry and a very mature citizenry. So people were in the driving seat. And these were people empowered to be in the driving seat. Uh, it was not a leader's um, kind of uh, quest with uh, with uh, with supporters, followers, advents going uh, behind. This was people's uh, aim. And in that, it is it is extremely internal. It is extremely grounded in Armenia. So um, that uh, that I guess uh, we we were uh, many surprised and. Uh, I, I think Pashinyan himself, when uh, these many kind of uh, geopolitical questions were asked of, uh, because this was completely local, internal, grassroots thing. So, but of course the question should be answered. How, how do you uh, now uh, relate to the world? And uh, the, 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 in, my, in my take, again, not being a foreign policy expert, um, I think the questions were answered in a very also uh, down to, to earth way that were being not geopolitical, were not after changing uh, in that reality. But, but having said that, it was very clearly stated that improvement of relations and of all relations, including with Russia, with Georgia, is on the agenda because uh, as uh, as um, marred the internal field was internal politics as a reflection was the external. Uh, th 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 there is this tie. So uh, now cleaning internally, it is the hope and the rational kind of prediction that would bring some more, um, some more rational and some more um, accountable relations with the, uh, with the neighbors, going back from these quick fixes. Oh, now we go to Europe, now we don't go to Europe. Now we're uh, friends uh, with Russia, now we're uh, very, uh, very negative about Russia selling arms. To so it's this, this, uh, this uh, jumps and quick fixes, this is what I hope will, be, uh, will end and some consistency in internal and external will uh, will join i don't think that um, it is catchy because it is not it is not something that can be exported you cannot export all the people's awakening what you can really be an example of what can the citizenry do when they decide um yeah first regarding could it be exported, this example, particularly this type of example, like it happened in Arab Spring? I'm not sure, because during the Arab, Arab Spring, the environment in many countries were quite similar. Uh, but in Armenia, we had quite unique environment that I don't see that uh, is more or less the same in at least other countries of the region. Um, but uh, coming back to, to relations with Russia, uh, the new government is somehow afraid of, of Russia. I mean, they're afraid that Russia will support this counter-revolution. So that's why I guess they are very careful on, on Russia issues. Because at some point, because generally, I don't need to explain here that Russia doesn't need a democratic regime in Armenia. Uh, but from some point, they will use the Russian propaganda tools, for example, will, will use every mistake done by Armenian governments. And of course, they're going to do these mistakes because they're, they plan to do many reforms because of their somehow unexperienced and so on. Uh, anyone is doing mistakes. Uh, they will use every mistake in order to uh, 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 as a propaganda tool against against this government, and uh, but that's not o not the only reason. There are other tools that Russians could uh, could use against the Armenian government as well. For example, delays with arms supplies or or new arms deal with uh, with Azerbaijan. Uh, that's that's some problematic issues that Armenian governments, I guess, they're afraid of. So that's why they're quite careful and they, uh, the same people who were talking about Armenia's 
exit from Eurasian Union less than a year ago, who were demanding that. Uh, they are now quite careful on those issues. Just, just a little. So uh, every nation has to be governed by its national interests, basically every state. And uh, previously we have been being governed uh, by Russia's interests most of the time. And uh, we were kind of enslaved uh, in our decision making uh, because of the property that Russia has, because of different types of dependence. Uh, and uh, the, the government, the new government is uh, explicitly stating that this is going to be Armenian-centered foreign policy. We are not um, pro-Russian, pro-European, pro-American, and we are not anti-Russian, anti-European, anti and anti-American. So we should be governed by other, our interests, and we should become a stronger state to be in a better position to negotiate with different states uh, on our interests. This much. Um, thank you very, very much. Um, I um, will now take some questions from uh, from audience uh, back there. And there should be um, microphones, hopefully. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Mary, and thanks to the panel for the presentation. I'm Anthony Boyer with IFAS. Uh, I was curious to know, you've mentioned election law reform, uh, election systemic reform as well. What are your priorities in terms of the election management reform, uh, working with the Central Election Commission and the other uh, election management bodies? Thank you. Thank you very much. So first of all, I would like to mention that Central Election Commission is uh, a constitutional body. So it can be changed uh, by electoral code. Uh, for, for, for changes of, uh, let's say, formation process of Central Electoral Commission is uh, needed uh, to, uh, the amendments of constitutions are, uh, constitution are needed. And uh, what I can see, government is not planning to do that now at least, before the snap elections, maybe later, I don't know. Uh, regarding the other electoral commissions like territorial and local, uh, electoral commissions, uh, locals are the ones in, in, the, in the polling stations. Uh, that's possible, that's, that's on the table. I wouldn't say that there is uh, some consensus regarding that issue, because regarding the three main important issues that I have mentioned, we, we have almost a consensus with almost uh, all the CSOs, with uh, almost all the political parties. But regarding uh, electoral management, we we don't have a consensus. We don't have a unique meaning that it should be changed or if it should be changed, in which way it should be changed. Yes, we don't have a consensus, and also we don't have a consensus regarding uh, whether the same uh, composition of the uh, electoral, uh, Central Electoral Commission should change and the uh, leadership should change. Like I can say our opinion. We think that it's a matter of credibility because the, this existing uh, Central Electoral Commission has been in charge of violation of several elections already. And even if they give promises that they are going to uh, work well, and we, I think they would wo work well wi without uh, control and without direction by uh, Sir Sarkisian's uh, surrounding and re his regime, still it's a matter of credibility and it would be better, uh, in our opinion, to uh, change this uh, composition. But we are not sure how this um, political negotiations will uh, end and uh, to what extent it will be possible. Hi. The prosecution and judiciary are important institutions in the fight against corruption. Um, so I'd be curious in the panelists' um, thoughts on what reforms could be taken in those two institutions to help align it closely um, or more closely with the protests' um, values. Hi, my name is Roshani Mansour. I'm from the Department of State. Um, 
reform of judiciary and of prosecution is uh, is extremely important because as uh, I said before and as I mean for many years Armenia has been going through judicial reforms uh, and uh, trust in judiciary st stands in single digits and uh, the report of 2013 of the Ombudsman uh, uh, of Armenia showed enormous, I mean, in figures, in numbers, corruption uh, among the judiciary. Um, dependence of judiciary of the executive, control of uh, judiciary of the executive, all the executive, and not only through legal means, uh, but through personal means, uh, is, uh, is well established. Um, so that's that's a very problematic area. As is prosecutor's office, which by the law, particularly recent changes after constitutional change, made really dependent under not even the executive but one person, the prime minister. So, um, however, changes in the in those bodies, um, changes personnel changes cannot be done uh, with current existing legislation right now, with current existing parliament. So I, it's my personal opinion. I'm not, uh, I don't think these changes uh, will be conducted uh, at the moment currently before the elections. Um, but uh, what, is, what is already happening, a lot of that law enforcement that was created and controlled so tightly to support uh, a very, uh, very anti-human rights and anti-fair trial and access to justice state um, is now changing itself by uh, many of the old guard uh, retiring. Uh, we've seen heads of uh, the investigative, special investigative uh, office retiring yesterday or the day before yesterday. And these are, uh, by the virtue of that centralization, who is in the head, who is the head of that uh, institution really matters because they were created to be dependent, they were created to be uh, hierarchical. Um, uh, as for judiciary, uh, it has been said, and we personally, I, I very much value the, uh, the approach that was so many times repeated, that as an executive, I'm not going to um, distribute orders to judiciary. There is fair amount, there are fair amount of laws in place. There is the process in place. The judiciary is empowered legislatively to rule justly. It should rule justly. It should live up to its um, uh, call. So this is the approach that uh, uh, the new government, uh, the new governance, the new leadership took. I personally, as a human rights uh, advocate, value that enormously because it is so tempting in a country so centralized and so with so much violation of human rights to come and, and uh, fair trial and access to justice. Uh, ruling in European Court of Human Rights against Armenia are mostly on fair trial. Um, uh, it's so tempting to come and uh, start dismissing old guard and cleaning that. but. We know from the example of other countries how it fires back. So this this approach is uh, so extremely important. As for the future, as I mentioned briefly, there are really uh, very serious researches in how that judiciary is made actually dependent in how many layers, financially, administratively, and by uh, selection process. So those are very well researched. So if there is a political will and political capacity, having the parliament, uh, the, the chance to vote, uh, I think that can be done very systematically and very profoundly. So this is, uh, this is uh, my understanding of how it is going to happen. Um, if I may just add something, uh, actually uh, uh, among our team, the best expert on those questions is David Khachatran, who is sitting here, who used to work for Department of Justice in the U.S. Embassy uh, to Armenia. So maybe you would ask him if you if you're interested in particular details. But uh, another thing that was mentioned, and I would like to focus on, is that. Uh, before uh, before all this happened in, uh, in uh, during the winter 
some amendments in legislation were done to create a super powerful prime minister uh, with so many uh, power that even the pre previously the president didn't have in Armenia. And uh, at this point, at this stage, somehow it's good in, uh, when you have a good prime minister to, uh, to implement changes faster. But in long term, of course, that's, that's very bad for the country. And what's very important that uh, the new government, they, they stated that they will change it. They will share their power with the parliament. And this is something that in, even in democratic countries, uh, leaders wouldn't like to do. Uh, nobody wants to share its power with, with others when he already has that power. So this is also something that should be supported. Just briefly adding, um, um, without going into uh, profound legislative uh, reform, um, a s situation can change uh, very seriously. Um, how through uh, through uh, not only through people res uh, resigning and uh, new less corrupt and less dependent compromised people appointment, but also through rendering uh, and administering a very credible transitional justice process. So that would the precedent uh, would really be very important here. Uh, it is also a very challenging task because um, uh, the, the, any any corruption revelation, human rights revelation, and uh, according investigation, uh, not prosecution. There hasn't been any prosecution, but investigation all already is dubbed as politically motivated and uh, new regimes. Uh, attack on the old guard. So uh, that's why it's very important to understand that this enormous uprising and quest for justice ne in people needs to be supported with already precedents of justice delivered, even if delayed justice delivered. And that should be also acknowledge the importance of that, and the importance of that particularly in view of not willing to come and dismiss all old and corrupt judiciary and appoint your people. So um, that is important to uh, understand how it can be manipulated, but how important it is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dominic Toxov. I'm working for the uh, German Heinrich Böll Foundation. Um, I, I want to pick up uh, um, one thing that, I, that Daniel just mentioned. Um, if I understood you correctly, you said um, the new government needs to take a sort of balanced approach towards Russia because of the arms um, exp um, imports from Russia. Um, and I'm wondering, isn't that also like a chance right now to sort of rethink that whole sort of arms race with Azerbaijan? I understand it's a very sensitive topic with Nagorno-Karabakh, et cetera, but um, are there discussions in Armenia right now about reducing sort of arms exports? Hi there, I'm Matthew, and I'm a congressional staffer on Capitol Hill, and I actually was going to ask a very similar question, which is about the sensitive issue of Azerbaijan, and specifically, the way in which the opposition and civil society, which may now have an opportunity to govern, view that issue and how their view of that issue may differ from the previous government. Yeah. So actually regarding uh, the arms uh, delivery, uh, yes, Russia created uh, an environment when Armenia and Azerbaijan are forced to, to buy arms uh, from Russia, because Russia is the actually the only uh, big supplier of, of, of arms in the world that agrees to sell arms uh, to the sites of conflict here. Uh, so, and, and that's a problematic, and, and two states are competing with each other in order to have better armed arms deal with Russia. Uh, to have 
faster delivered arms and so on. So that's 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 a problem uh, and unfortunately Armenia or Azerbaijan just alone I'm not sure that they can get out of this circle. Uh, and just few words regarding uh, regarding the conflict issue. Just generally, some general thoughts. Uh, in order to solve the Karabakh conflict, it is strongly needed to have democracy on both sides, on Armenian side and on Azerbaijani side. Now we already, I can say that we are on the way to having democracy in Armenia, and I hope after the elections uh, we will say that for sure that we finally have a democratic uh, country and. In the next years, I hope we will have a totally a society with uh, democratic values. But, uh, but that's not enough. That's not enough. It's needed uh, on both sides. In the long term, that's the only way to solve the conflict. Thank you. May I add? Um uh, democracy is the key uh, in the solution of the problem and sustainable solution of the problem, definitely. And one new thing that, new, that the new government is also suggesting based on the same philosophy is that uh, Armenia cannot represent, he cannot represent the people of Karabakh in the negotiation process because he's not elected by Karabakh people. And uh, Karabakh, uh, we do not represent their interests, so uh, they should be represented by uh, their person. And this is one key thing that he is going to propose to the Minsk group. Some uh, are kind of criticizing him that this is uh, this might sabotage the process of negotiations, but this is something that will uh, be uh, instrumental for having uh, effective uh, negotiation process and coming to an outcome which satisfies uh, the interests of people who, who will be affected by the decision making, basically. Uh, let me take um, Kathy and then um, the gentleman in the front. Um, Kathy Kosman, uh, thank you so much for this. Um, two quick questions. One is, uh, what about the role, if there is one, of the Soviet-era Armenian dissidents, the members of the uh, Armenian Helsinki group and Paruir Harikyan? That's one question. And the other, a follow-up to Larissa's mention of the need to reform the labor code. I'm wondering if she could give us some more details. Thank you. And, and take one more here. Um. <clears throat> Tom Timberg, <laughs> consultant. I realize this is not your focus and it's very early in the process, but talking about potential counter-revolutionary forces, what has the relationship of the new government been to the powerful, basically international investors in Armenia, such as the diamond uh, interests and so forth, and of course the, uh, the people who are concerned with uh, uh, import of consumer goods who would be very vulnerable to significant uh, uh, commercial policy changes. The, the Soviet dissidents, yeah, Soviet era dissidents. Parut um, Harigan is um, has, if I am not mistaken, in the very early days of um, when it's only only was starting and was summoning 200, 300 people in the square, he was uh, he was part uh, of the demonstrations. Um, since then, I haven't heard him speak. Um, it, Kind of supporting the the anti serge movement, the civic part of it, because he was. But uh, but I haven't heard him speak. I I, I haven't followed uh, that, so I cannot. If colleagues can add, then I cannot say much. But um, other kind of uh, yet Soviet uh, times, 
uh, protesters uh, who haven't been in political uh, but civil society arena, such as Aveti uh, Kishkanyan, such as um, uh, other Helsinki people, they're all very actively engaged, had been engaged uh, when the protest was being crushed uh, in violence in their civil society human rights advocates capacity. Um, some of them, uh, they're now already kind of uh, tr very actively providing checks and balances on the new uh, government when they don't like uh, something happening. So we're happy we we'll have civil society, critical civil society still in place. So old guard is, uh, is watching. Um, and so that's, uh, that's very good. Uh, on labor got very, quote, very important issue. Um, the enslaving, pardon the word, but this is very close to what was happening, uh, of uh, white spectrum and number of population was happening through exactly uh, stripping them of their basic labor rights. Uh, stripping in a way that they were not enforceable in any way. Years ago, four maybe, maybe five years ago, colleagues would uh, uh, correct me, the labor inspection was disma dismantled. The inspection that would protect the right, I mean, if you look into we're, we're basically all the Soviet's regulations in place, so as an executive of an office, I might have someone walk in in summer and say, oh, you, you don't have, it's very hot and you're abusing people's rights. That's, that's there in, in place, but there is no one to enforce violation of rights. And that amounted to people, teachers, uh, doctors, uh, being made vote as they were made. Their labor contracts were for 11 months, for uh, nine months if teachers. Um, and they were threatened uh, with no extension of that contract if they don't vote, if they don't obey, if they don't do, if they don't bribe. So that was, that was kind of basic violations of their political right, their dignity through that labor uh, dependence. Um, the oligarchs, and uh, thanks to Daniel's organization, we have now hard proof of that happening with teachers. Uh, some other leaked uh, into social media information from um, uh, last elections where um, uh, um, um, oligarch who is now in the parliament, um, uh, owner of a wide range of several, several different uh, uh, chains of stores and supermarkets, uh, was having a staff meeting of his staff, intimidating and humiliating people, uh, challenging them to bring vote or would be dismissed. Uh, and that's, so that was done, uh, people work without labor contracts in construction without any labor uh, rights preserved. So that is of extreme importance um, uh, to restore people's dignity. The, labor trade uh, unions are non-existent in Armenia. And um, um, uh, it's indeed beyond my scope on diamond and uh, uh, other, and I don't think that is, there has been enough time for that, but I don't know. So regarding uh, your question about investors, uh, the main investors in Armenia or uh, the main holders of, of investments, so-called, are in Armenia are Russian-based, mainly even Russian state corporations, uh, mainly in the energetic sector. Uh, but uh, quite interesting example that we observe last week, last week, right? L last week with high voltage. I guess it was last week, maybe, maybe the previous week, it doesn't matter. Uh, so the previous government signed it, uh, uh, Press a deal with uh, Russian-based uh, Armenian uh, businessman oligarch uh, who is in a good relations with Kremlin uh, on selling to him uh, the high voltage electric networks of Armenia, and the current government just uh, last week they cancelled this deal which was very, uh, which could be very dangerous. I mean, th this deal could be very dangerous. Uh, 
because of this guy who already owns the electric networks and if he would hold the high voltage electric networks there was a big risk of monopoly uh, and regarding import of goods uh, the import of goods is mainly regulated no, not by national legislation but uh, by the legislation of Eurasian Union so Armenia has very low influence on that uh, legislation but Armenia is implementing that legislation the previous government, uh, they, they gave some, uh, some monopoly or some privileges to, to some of oligarchs, which were killing actually the businesses of those who were trying or who were thinking on competition, uh, competing with them. And, but now, hopefully, we will have uh, a better environment, more legal environment, which would uh, lead to... Uh, I mean, uh, which, which will lead to have a equal uh, environment for everyone. So uh, the competition now hopefully is possible in the field of import of goods. Thank you. I can add on the labor uh, code issues. Um, so previous government, I think starting from the fall of last year, they started, initiated amendments to the labor code. Uh, some of them were fine, the others are, were very problematic, and this issue has been being raised uh, with the previous government for several months by civil society organizations, and now these problems are raised already with the new government, uh, new Minister of uh, Labor and Social Affairs, and hopefully those will not pass. Basically, the law, uh, the, the code, creates unequal conditions for the employees and employers and makes them uh, not necessarily enter into written contracts, but uh, they may negotiate certain agreements orally. Meanwhile, they have completely different uh, conditions, different different um, grounds, so they are different. Uh, and they are not equal, uh, equally powerful in uh, negotiating, and the employees are very much dependent on the employers, uh, and the labor market is very, very uh, low. S small. Um, so this is in process of uh, being fixed. Uh, we just can express the hope that uh, after some time it will be improved. Take, so we only have about five minutes. So why don't I take a few questions? Take one, two, three together, and then we'll kind of respond to those and use them to close. Thank you. Lawrence Avazian, Eurasia Foundation. Um, I think. Uh, one thing that the government is, is trying to demonstrate is the sufficiency of the Constitution. And um, so not interfering with the judiciary and remaining within the executive and using all the levers that the executive has it as, as it, at its disposal. And uh, we remember Saakashvili and the way he consolidated his move, movement back then and, and, and held the street for so long was s all of a sudden, very rapidly, no bribes by the police where the, for, to drivers, uh, I, I re, re demanded of drivers. You went and you got a document notarized, no side payments. So the people felt where they lived that this was a huge difference suddenly. And I'm wondering if you know whether the government intends to use its executive power, power of appointment, to show the street that there is a soft transitional justice plan before the, the harder transition, uh, transitional justice can be implemented. Namely, people know very well the corruption, the fiefdoms that existed at each university, each hospital, and institutions like this. Is there a plan afoot to, to make rapid changes to show the street that yes, we're moving quickly where we can within, within the executive branch? Responses to it. Natalia Otel Bellin from the Center for International Private Enterprise. Um, Daniel, you touched upon um, Armenia's membership in the customs union. Is the new government uh, looking into sort of Armenia's long term interest, whether this is in Armenia's interest to continue being a member of the customs union? Thank you. 
Tilmira Matekubo, Central Asia Program at Elliott School. Sona, you mentioned uh, that the civil society has been prepared for over 10, 20, uh, 10 years. And I'm curious, um, so the role of uh, educational institutions um, and also grassroots organizations uh, in the country um, in emboldening and empowering the civil society. So we see the uh, this vast mobility of the population, especially um, youth mobility. So therefore, I'm curious the role of the educational organizations as well as the local government. So also another question would be also similar. The how active uh, is the local government? Is it, um, so the, the does it, uh, is it concerned about the um, people's um, interests or does it, I mean, so the role of the local governance, uh, are there any reforms in the um, local governance structure? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Um, so maybe what we'll do now is maybe you touching on those questions, make some final remarks with each of you, starting with Lawrence. Um, um, going to uh, Lawrence's question, there are no plans, there are actions already. Um, we, um, it is a fact that um, the large scale money collecting in public schools for graduation balls and uh, um, presents to teachers and principals are off the table. They, uh, they're already not happening. Um, and um, education sector is, um, is, is, is one of notoriously corrupt in Armenia. Um, the customs, uh, on the second day, literally, uh, without any yet transition happening um, of uh, Pashinyan's election, the situation on, in, on the customs, uh, at the customs stations has dramatically changed. People do not offer, people do not uh, exhort uh, bribes. Um, doesn't mean the customs uh, work uh, uh, very uh, without uh, corruption, but at least at the level of uh, individual small importers, that extortion, that bribing is stopped. So these are the people to feel the, uh, of course, the problems with uh, import and taxation is, 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 a, is a huge one and shall be resolved in systemic way. Um, uh, the, the, same, uh, the same is happening with uh, uh, police and traffic uh, police uh, particularly, so it is happening. I don't know whether there has been a paper or whatever, but things are happening that are tangible. Um, and uh, I would only uh, touch on the um, on the on the um, education institutions. If anything, the education institutions, schools and universities included, were uh, making everything and very effectively that no such awakening ever happens. Uh, the hierarchical, very corrupt uh, uh, system was uh, breeding a very different type of a student and citizen. Um, so uh, that it happened, uh, I guess, exactly because of very diligent and very uh, grassroots work of uh, some of the organizations, uh, including Transparency International, uh, Union of Informed Citizens, other uh, partners that were uh, literally were doing work that we thought would s at best pay, uh, pay back in 10, 15 years, but not at that scale. We were not aware of the imprint we're uh, leaving, so I'll stop there. So, uh, Yeah, I would like to add something first about medical and ed educational institutions. Many of them are independent from the executive government. Uh, and what we see and what we hear from them that they don't want to implement some illegal mechanism to, to force them to do something or not to do something. I mean, the executive government doesn't want to use that means uh, on uh, independent uh, institutions. Uh, regarding Eurasian uh, Economic Union, uh, yeah, that, that's clear for everyone that in long term, uh, Eurasian Economic Union is very bad for Armenian economy. 
uh, particularly we will feel many uh, quite dangerous for economy or harmful for economy custom duties since uh, January uh, uh, 2020. So uh, yes, and that's what the same people who are now in the government were saying last year in September, October, they were demanding uh, that Armenia should should exit uh, from uh, from the union. Uh, but because of the uh, this union is not just economic union actually. It is also political union, and it would be very harmful for Russia if someone uh, will leave this union. At this stage, they are afraid to talk about that, and they say that Armenia will remain in Eurasian Union. Um, but I guess maybe in long term, uh, maybe after the elections, I don't know, I can say that on behalf of the government, uh, but uh, uh, probably this, this issue will, will came back to discussions to the table uh, in next, uh, next years. Uh, and just a, sh the, just a short comment regarding local governments. Uh, local government system in Armenia was made so that it didn't have real independence uh, from the central government. And that's why actually local government's reform is also needed, uh, on my viewpoint at least. But, uh, but now mainly the people who hold uh, the local governments are uh, Republicans, so people from the previous ruling party. And many of them uh, would, if the moment comes, they would support so-called counter-revolution. Uh, but at the same time, they're very weak from the viewpoint of their uh, public trust or their uh, from any viewpoint. Just continuing on the local government, so they have never been uh, democratically elected. Either there were uh, not competition because there was a big, uh, powerful Republican supported guy. Uh, everyone understood that he is going to win and mostly those were men actually. We didn't have many women. So people were not really competing uh, for the local government and um, they, the local government uh, representatives uh, were acting like local feudals, and even local government councils were uh, council members were appearing in the council to serve their interest or their own interest or their family interest. So, uh, and local governments as uh, such uh, as an institution didn't really. Um, participate uh, in the revolution process. I think it was pretty much individual. Some of them probably were sympathetic. Some of it, most of them, most of them, majority of them probably not. And actually they were, most of them were Republicans, maybe 70 or more percent, but they were forced to become Republicans in, or, Republicans in order to have a good career. So not all of them were sharing these uh, Republican um, positions. Uh, speaking about this preparation for 10 years, actually, uh, maybe I was misunderstood, but it's not that we were preparing ourselves uh, for a revolution, but the government has prepared uh, the civil society for the revolution. And all the cases that have been, uh, basically people were raising all the time policy related issues without recognizing it, but they were raising case, case they were case based approaches as well, but they were also policy based approaches. But uh, they, there have been never ever any policy resolution by the government. So people were, under, were understanding that they cannot uh, to, they cannot fight for each and every case throughout the country, so they need to come to, with the policy solutions, but it never happens. So, uh, speaking about the grassroots organizations, yes, so the, frankly saying several years ago, I was uh, very skeptical about the educational uh, process, education of uh, civic education process. Uh, 
I was because of its long-term uh, outcomes uh, and because you couldn't see the results at the moment, so I was a bit skeptical. But recently, we also started uh, working with uh, mostly the youth, and many organizations are going were working with youth, and many international organizations were also supporting different programs, different uh, approaches, uh, different focus. But I think that uh, all these efforts have uh, eventually contributed to the development of some potential uh, and some uh, change some values uh, throughout the country. As for the educational institutions, the educational institutions in Armenia uh, need a serious revision um, of the governance, of the content, uh, of the management. So uh, speaking about uh, higher education, probably I can say so they, the boards of higher educational institutions are composed to, of high level officials and also Republican high level officials. And like Serge Sarkisyan, for example, was the head of the, uh, he, he is still the head of the board of Yerevan State University, let's say. And all the universities have this highest Republican uh, people on their boards, and that, that creates a lot of uh, dependence of the university uh, uh, directors, what's the name, uh, or or the all the universities have this um, so-called student councils, which is a like small units of republicans, and the educational system has been both at the, at the higher level, higher educational level, as well as the secondary education level. It was basically killing the critical thinking. So, uh, if we it continued like this for after several years, we wouldn't probably have um, people uh, who would go out to the street, who would criticize. So uh, the educational system didn't really prepare as such uh, for the revolution again. But because it was like that, it kind of, uh, some people, some young people uh, were, came up with an initiative actually a few months ago and that was one of the supporting and contributing factors of the youth um, uh, renaissance, <laughs> if we can call it like that. So I think in fall uh, last year, a, f a s small group of young students, they came up with a resistance with some, uh, in regard with some uh, legal provisions uh, made by the Ministry of Defense that all the people, so, uh, all the young people have to serve in the army and they were claiming that the students shouldn't really go to the army. So I'm, I'm just trying to generalize uh, the concept. So they started uh, with this issue, but then it evolved uh, into a different issue, like Yerevan State University restart process, at, as they were called, YSU restart. And now, uh, and this group that was already um, existing, it already mobilized students around completely different issues. And in the beginning, they were even skeptical whether they should join this reject search uh, movement or they shouldn't. So they became instrumental uh, for this process. And it was their, exactly their participation that within one day and within a few hours, basically, made the uh, size of the um, crowd or movement uh, from maybe uh, several thousands to several t uh, dozens of thousands. So uh, it, it was very helpful. So basically we had already some little movement of students, which were, however, many have been sympathetic about them. So they were uh, very critical. They were always very critical uh, in that regard. Okay. Um, great. Thank you so much. Um, this has been a really fascinating discussion, and we can see that Armenia is at a critical point. Um, there's been, you know, this great change, and there's opportunity for reform. And you've laid out uh, quite a program. There are so many problems and so many. Uh, things that need to be addressed, everything from constitutional issues where the previous constitution was written um, for, for, for a very specific pur purpose and enlarged this role of the prime minister uh, to problems with education, with uh, um, 
you know, a, a whole range of things that, um, that that came out today. So there's quite a quite a lot to be done, um, and we're uh, very hopeful um, about the possibility for civil society to feed into these processes. It seems like a very a moment where your um, different ideas about anti-corruption work, about better electoral systems and uh, regulations can have a real impact, can be, um, can be taken up, and we're, we're very excited for you, and we know that you go back to participate in, in a very important process, and um, we're, we're grateful you were here, and I hope you know in six months or a year you'll come back and uh, tell us uh, what great things have been achieved and how far Armenia uh, has come, so. <laughs> Thank you.